Members of the General Assembly and distinguished guests, it is my pleasure to welcome and to give to you for her address to the joint session, Her Excellency, the Governor of the great state of North Carolina, the Honorable Beverly Eves Purdue. Thank you. Thank you to the folks in the gallery, too. Speaker Hackney, President Pro Tem Bass Knight, Lieutenant Governor Dalton, and members of the General Assembly, and all of you honored guests tonight who are assembled here with us. Let me recognize some folks who are really important to me, the people who put up with this for so long. My son's up in the balcony. Garrett and his wife, April, and Emmett and his fiance, Sarah. And then there's another really important guy in my life. Unlike many of us, most of us actually, he didn't seek this position, but he ac accepts it. The truth would be on some nights he puts up with it because there's never a home-cooked meal in our household. North Carolina's very first first gentleman, Bob Eves. Tonight, I ask you to join me in expressing North Carolina's deepest gratitude to our nation's soldiers, the sailors, the airmen, and the Marines, the Coast Guard, and the members of the National Guard, and all those reserves across this great state. They call North Carolina their home. We send a special thank you to the families of our military because we in North Carolina understand that service to the military is a family commitment. With us tonight is Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey Copeland and his wife, June. Jeff is the commander of the 1st 130th Attack Reconnaissance Battalion. He is joined in the gallery by Staff Sergeant David Rhodes, who is an aircraft mechanic in Delta Company, and his wife, Michelle. Let's all recognize them and say thank you. tell you a little bit about this squadron. They were the nation's very first reserve helicopter battalion that was deployed after 9-11. They served 17 months in Afghanistan. In a week, Jeff and David and 480 other members of this same unit will leave again in a deployment to Iraq. We thank you guys and all the members of your battalion we hold you in our prayers, and we wish you Godspeed and success in your mission. here with you tonight. I want to thank the citizens of North Carolina for giving me the opportunity to serve as the governor of the greatest state in America. And might I add, in case some of you have forgotten, North Carolina's very first female governor. <laughs> I, I remember the first time I sat in this chamber as a freshman, right up here. I don't know why they put freshmen in the front in those days, but that's what they did. 
there were 24 women in the General Assembly. Today, as I look around, there are 43 women in this body. The legislative choir in these times has a broader and stronger and my more diverse voice. More points of view are being heard in state government, and my friends, that's a very good thing for North Carolina. North Carolina, like most states, has been thrown into the midst of a global economic crisis. To come through it, we will and we must make very tough decisions, choices that I will make and that you will make. That's our job and our responsibility, to confront the difficult circumstances and deal with them, to move wisely, prudently, and decisively, to do what we must do to get through the tough times as we also position ourselves and North Carolina to seize the opportunities of the future. That is why, as much as it's my privilege to talk with you tonight, I also want to speak frankly to the citizens of North Carolina. Let me just frame the picture for all of you. Families all around North Carolina are anxious. Many have lost their jobs, and many others have lost their homes. As I travel around the state, and I do just like you do, I see the uncertainty and the worry in the eyes of North Carolinians. When I made one of my surprise site visits recently to a state employment office, I spent about an hour talking to the people, listening to them, and I heard what they were saying. I talked to a 70-year-old gentleman about why he was there. He told me about how he had spent or lost all of his retirement savings. And there he was, looking for a job, when what he thought his life would hold from him was a head toward retirement. A woman was there with her three kids in tow. She'd lost her job. I listened to her tell the employment counselor, I'll take anything that you have. I've got to have a job. I've got to support my kids and my family. And in that same line, there was a PhD who thought that he was in a cutting edge, permanent 21st century career. But instead that day, he found himself in an unemployment line. These people are North Carolina. They're America. And as elected officials, it is our moral responsibility to work together to help our citizens restart their lives. That is why we are here. Now I know that those of us in this chamber tonight can't fix everything. Nobody can. But there are some things that we can do. By making the tough choices, by taking decisive action to meet our challenges, we can and we will be part of the solutions that we need to move North Carolina forward. For me, I will do whatever it takes to pay our state's bills, to keep our kids healthy and in school, to make sure that our seniors, when they need care, can get it, to keep prisoners locked up and to keep our community safe. We will provide jobs and create ways for those who are out of work to learn new skills. We will do that. So let me be direct with you. This is what we must do now and for the future of North Carolina. We start by reviving North Carolina's economy. We must go after every federal recovery dollar that's available. We need to get that money into North Carolina and put our people back to work by... We'll put our people back to work by building bridges and paving roads and expanding and in renovating our infrastructure. It'll take engineers and architects and con contractors and technology experts and laborers of all types. It was no joke when I said if South Carolina's governor didn't want his federal recovery funds 
As bad a driver as I am, I would drive a pickup truck down and I would get his share of the money. I know, I know, and you know how to put these dollars to good use and help our people. And to those folks in South Carolina, I offer them a warm invitation. Come on up here to North Carolina, stay a while and see how we in the Tar Heel st State can push forward even in tough times. That's what we can do for the people in our state. But back to business. We will ensure that the recovery dollars are spent with maximum efficiency, transparency, and accountability. That's really important. I have put together a team of economic recovery and investment. They're going to track every single dollar. With the click of a mouse, taxpayers can go to ncrecovery.gov and see the details of what North Carolina is doing and how we're investing those funds. You'll know where the money went, who got the contract, and when they completed the work. And soon, NC Open Book will do the same for every state contract and grant that's worth more than $10,000. This is taking care of the people's business, North Carolina style. But we can't rely on the federal government alone. We have to do whatever it takes on our own here in North Carolina to create jobs, to help displaced workers get new jobs, and to keep their families in their homes. We cannot, we will not, let our citizens' dreams for the future die, not in North Carolina. We're already transforming some of our traditional industries into 21st century jobs. NC State is leading the nation in developing lightweight textiles that are used in the aerospace industry. That's how we got cutting edge work that helped us bring Spirit Aero Systems here with more than 1,000 jobs. We have broadened our traditional agricultural economy and have become a mecca for biotech, for pharmaceuticals, and the life sciences because we've uniquely brought together government and higher ed and the private sector. This allows ideas to springboard from the lab to the marketplace. Just look around this state at Quintiles and Merck and Bayer and Biogen and PPD and so many more. So even as we work to grow this new economy, we must also transform the way we invest the people's money. Starting today, it is no longer business as usual for North Carolina's budget. I want all of our citizens to know that it's a new day in North Carolina. Everything is on the table. We do not have time for talk show political posturing or petty partisan games, not on my watch, not in these times. We're confronted with challenges that our state has not seen since the Great Depression. With a three billion plus dollar shortfall, we have to be upfront and make hard, painful decisions. Truth in budgeting time is here, now, today. It's what we must do to balance the budget and put North Carolina on strong footing for now and for the future. You know, cutting the fat is a cliche that doesn't go far enough. In the budget I present next week, we will reduce and cut state government programs and services that many, including me, know have been effective, but which in these times we simply cannot afford. For North Carolina, education is the priority. Even as we search out ways to cope with the deteriorating economic landscape, we have to be sure to protect North Carolina's most precious asset, our children, who are our future workers. So we have to find ways to be inventive and engaging in the ways our schools work and kids learn 
we must, as that old saying goes, not eat our seed corn, but continue to move forward on education to keep North Carolina competitive in the global marketplace. And yes, even in these tough times, we will increase per pupil spending in our public schools this year. While we hold school, schools and teachers and students accountable, we will bring some sanity to North Carolina's own testing mania by eliminating duplicative or unnecessary tests. I have reorganized our public schools with Bill Harrison becoming both the CEO of the State Board of Education and of the Department of Public Instruction, adding accountability and clear direction to a system that is badly in need of both. And as we make sure our schools perform, we must expect no less from all of our citizens. No child in North Carolina has permission to drop out. And in North Carolina, no teacher has permission to give up on any student. No parent has a free pass from their responsibility to be fully involved in their child's education. And no segment of our community, particularly our business community, gets a free pass on education. Our business leaders need to put a lot of energy, as they do now, into making sure that North Carolina's tax rate is competitive. They really need to put that same effort into helping North Carolina be the home of the nation's best educated workforce. And we will begin my college promise to remove financial barriers for access to higher education. In this global economy, education beyond high school is not a luxury, it's a necessity. My efforts create a pathway that starts in pre-kindergarten, offering courses of study that fit a student's needs, all the way through the vocational community college or college system, seamless learning, from pre-K through 20. That's the goal in North Carolina. And we will, in North Carolina, use technology to modernize our classrooms and, and enable teaching to catch up with the way our kids live. Let's face it, you all. Today's students show up at school with more technology in their pocket and in their backpacks than they find in their classrooms. For too many students, they actually ignore what's going on in the classroom while they are busy tweeting on Twitter, just like I see some of you doing while I'm talking. <laughs> North Carolina's virtual public high school will ensure that any child in any high school can take any class that he or she needs. This is the 21st century North Carolina. This levels the education playing field for students, and it also assures educational equity. And if we focus on education, we will also work to restore our citizens' faith in their government. In the 21st century, we must conduct the business of government in ways that bring transparency and accountability to the people. We will restore our citizens' confidence that government can help solve problems and work efficiently without wasting tax dollars. On my first day in office, I ordered reforms to change the face of state government. 
at the Department of Transportation, I insisted on openness and bringing professional decision making to the process. And some major policy decisions, like the zero tolerance policy in mental health and in corrections and other systems throughout state government, will sometimes be painful for all of us because I'm exposing weaknesses and in individual actions that are simply unacceptable and wrong in North Carolina. I believe that zero tolerance is how we find and correct the weaknesses that put people's lives at risk and that undermine faith in state government. I have set high expectations for myself and for everyone who works for North Carolina. We will be open and ethical and put the public's interest first. Taxpayers deserve no less from every state worker, and I expect nothing less from every state employee. And again, my friends, these same taxpayers deserve no less from you. As the legislature starts work on the budget and the important services that our citizens need, let me be clear about where I stand. Education is the engine that propels North Carolina's future. It cannot and it will not be sacrificed. This is the time. <laughs> this is the time to stand up to the sweet seductions of special interest, to the temptations of politically popular pork barrel spending, and in the practice of backroom dealing. Those days are gone because we simply cannot afford them in these perilous times. Our first and our only duty is to stand by North Carolina's families. That's why we're here. The choices we face are clear. We are each called to service, to courage, and to sacrifice. We have been given the privilege and the responsibility to govern during a really difficult time. We have been called, quite frankly, to the responsibility of leadership in North Carolina. And this is the time for all of us to answer that call. It's a time for ordinary citizens in this citizens' legislature to be extraordinary leaders. And we need not look far in North Carolina to find living examples of that kind of determination, hard work, and sacrifice that make ordinary people extraordinary heroes and sheroes. I look to Donna Dent, one of the heroic flight attendants on U.S. Airways Flight 1549 the miracle on the Hudson. Donna is with us this evening in the gallery. Donna, will you stand up so people can see you? bit about Donna. She calls herself just a little Winston-Salem girl who did her job. What a job this 1975 Reynolds High grad did. She made sure that every passenger on that plane got out of the Airbus 320 alive. She was the last to leave the, pilot, the plane with the pilot and the co-pilot that day. And then she took off her sweater and she gave it to a freezing passenger in a lifeboat. She did her job. She did her job. She was willing to give her life to help others. Donna Dent, an ordinary person who showed extraordinary leadership and courage as she did her job. She is North Carolina.
courageously. Acting courageously. The words are simple, aren't they? But today's challenges are not. Three quarters of a century ago, at a time not unlike now, Governor Max Gardner told the General Assembly then, the whole future of this state will be profoundly affected by the work you do here in the eventful days that lie just ahead. So as Governor Gardner called on the 1931 legislature to change the way government did business, I call upon you to join me in renewing and reinvigorating our service to North Carolina with the spirit of innovation and the purpose that these times demand. And last November, you, the voters, gave us the opportunity to make the tough decisions that the 21st century demands. You put your most sacred trust in us, your votes, you believed in us. You placed your future literally in our hands. We must not and we will not let you down. In these tough times, North Carolina must continue pushing ahead. We North Carolinians do not shy away from challenges and we absolutely do not quit. Simply getting our economy back to what it was isn't good enough. We will make our economy stronger. We all must have high expectations for ourselves and for North Carolina's futures. We all must exhibit extraordinary leadership and courage and determination and make the tough but right decisions. We will move North Carolina forward, even in these challenging times. And as the new day dawns for North Carolina and America, and it will, as we come out of this global recession, North Carolina, the old Tar Heel State, will be poised to take on the world. Good night, God bless you, and God bless North Carolina.